kids. Amen. We're all kids at heart. Open our Bibles, please, to the book of James as we continue our verse-by-verse study on Sunday mornings. By the way, if you're visiting here this morning, welcome. We welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what a blessing it is to come together as the body of Christ, to worship him, to hear from him through his word. You know, I love how in Hebrews we're told not to forsake the gathering together of the brethren as we come together to stir one another up to love and to good works. Amen? Amen. Amen. So James chapter 3, we're going to read from verses 13 uh, down to verse uh, 18, even though we'll just be studying the latter two verses. Uh, But let's go ahead and read, uh, start there in James chapter 3 with verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to study your word this morning, Lord, may we be those who are seekers of your wisdom, Lord. And that may your, again, your Holy Spirit open our hearts to receive, Lord, as we come uh, just as baby chicks to a mama, Lord. We just are so excited to be here to hear from you through your word, Lord, by your spirit. May I step out of the way even now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, last week, we we studied the first portion of this scripture. We looked at wisdom that is from below, wisdom that is of the world. It says that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And, you know, our world is full of this sort of wisdom. Can I have an amen? Amen. Man, this kind of wisdom is rampant all around us today, yet there is a wisdom that comes down from above. And as we are looking at this wisdom this morning, and within this crazy yet beautiful world, who does not need more wisdom in their life? Amen? Amen. Amen. But may we be those as we come to the well to drink this morning, the drink of the Lord and His Word by His Holy Spirit, that we receive what He has to say here through His Word. You know, as I look around this, and I know some of you probably get a little tiresome of me saying this, but I don't. We are living in the last days. You know, some people ask, we were just talking about it yesterday with a couple sweet folk. It's like, what do you tell people when they say, you know, we're living in the last days? Well, look at all the things going on. And and we do see the birth pangs, and we do see the different things. But the main key thing, the miracle that a lot of us can overlook so easily is, you know, it happened on May 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation again after almost 2,000 years. And again, if you look at the prophetic clock, it's right within God's timing. And and I believe that as Jesus said, within this generation, he will come. And so as we look for, for the last days, we also need to be careful, though, that as knowledge is poured out within our culture and within our world, and we do see knowledge being poured out exponentially, crazy to think of all the different things we can do on just a, a, even a little watch like this nowadays. I mean, this was Star Trek, you know, back in the 60s. You know, beam me up, Scotty, I'm, I'm ready, Lord, beam us up, you know. But we need to understand and be careful that, that even though there's a lot of knowledge, there's not a lot of wisdom. Even though there's a lot of knowledge, and even though, as we mentioned last week, our culture lifts up those who have a lot of head knowledge, most of those people don't have any wisdom. And we need to understand that there's a huge difference between, you know, knowledge and wisdom, especially a vast difference between that wisdom that is from this earth 
in that wisdom that is from above. Now, look at verse 13 again with me, if you will. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. You know, it's interesting, you know, we see here, and again, we covered this last week, but it's worth kind of just uh, emphasizing again, is that those within our culture, you know, there's a lot of people that we would look up to and point to and say that, that they're wise. And yet, as we look at what the, the fruit of wisdom is to be, you know, basically, they don't have good conduct. They don't have, you know, these different things. They don't have, verse 17, you know, pureness or peaceable. They're not gentle. They're not open to reason, full of mercy and good works, impartial and sincere. And as we come this morning, we need to understand, you, you know what? We need to be able, who is wise? We want to be wise, but we want to be wise in the things of the Lord and innocent in the things of the world. Too many of us are wise in the things of the world. Amen? Too many of us know how to get high. Too many of us know how to get drunk. Too many of us know, you know how to curse like a sailor. Too many of us know too many dirty jokes or watch too many bad things on television or on the internet. We're wise in a lot of things that we should not be wise in and we're weak in, in the things that we should not be weak in as Christians. Who is wise and understanding among you? Remember, beloved in Christ, wisdom as a Christian doesn't just come in how many years you can say you've been a Christian, a follower of Christ. Hey, I've met some people that, you know, say I've been a follower of Christ for 40 years, 50, 60 years. And yet they're still babes in Christ for they haven't been growing in the wisdom of the word of God. I love this, though, as we come here to verse 17. I, I always see verses like this and as, as a breath of fresh air into my life. Amen? I mean, look at this. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Can't you just almost hear music playing in the background as we're reading that? The sun shining through. I mean, I just love this. It, it brings a peace. And a harvest, verse 18, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, it's interesting. We kind of can maybe pass it over, but the desire to be wise goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Did you know that? All the way back to the Garden of Eden. I'll just read this to you in Genesis chapter 3. Now in verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than other beasts of the field that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and here's the key, it says this, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of this fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then both of their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The desire for wisdom, the desire for knowledge. And, and we understand that, you know, most of us know that the Lord came to King Solomon and said, you know, what do you want? I want to bless you. What do you want? Of anything, what can I give you? And he said, you know, Lord, if you could just give me wisdom to rule over your people, man, that would be great. And, and I love this. And I believe that was a wise thing for Solomon to ask for, for wisdom. There is a man's wisdom, though, as we covered last week. There is God's wisdom. Just flip over with me to 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 3. In your Bibles, 1 Corinthians, chapter 3. Looking at verses 18 and 19. There is man's wisdom and there is God's wisdom. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone amongst you, among you thinks he is wise in, in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. Can I have an amen? Amen. amen. You know, I love to witness to people. And, and one of the great uh, things that we, the Lord has opened up over the years, I remember witnessing, everybody remember AOL? America Online years ago, back in the 90s. Whoa! I did this like 20 years ago now. Wow, I'm freaking out. That's like old. But I remember one of the first things I loved about it is they had these little rooms that you, know, that you could go into and talk to different people. And there'd be Christian rooms and atheist rooms and there'd be a hodgepodge room. And I used to love to go into the hodgepodge rooms and witness. I even got turned in one time to AOL. You know, hey, this guy's in here talking about Jesus. It was funny. I'm like, dude, the room's called Front Porch, open to all ideas. You know, do whatever. But you know what's interesting? You know, even yesterday I was witnessing to a, a lady, and, and, and you know what? They think you're a fool. They think we're foolishness. To preach the cross, to preach, you know, repentance, to preach a new life in Christ, that there is actually sin, that there is hell. And they start to notice what they do. They, be, they, they, they make fun of us because the wisdom of this world says we are the fools. I'll be honest with you, when I was 19 years old and having just come out of the surf culture, all the sinful things that you would think of that, and I was involved in every one of them, and Jesus Christ, as I repented of my sins, and he saved me out of that, I, I have to tell you that I didn't like people thinking of me as a Jesus freak. That's what they would call you back in the early 80s. You know, I remember, you know, even, you know, with my, I'm not a Jesus freak. You know what, today I gladly receive. Call me a Jesus freak. Call me a fool for Christ. Call me a moron. Call me an idiot. Because notice what, what it says there in verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. The wisdom of this world almost tells us we're going to live forever here. Who wants to live forever here, by the way? Imagine if your body just kept getting older and older and older and older and older. And you never died, but everything kept breaking on you. Man. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans 1.22 we read, Claiming to be wise, they became fools. This is in the Amplified. It says, Professing to be smart, they made simpletons out of themselves. And by, the, and, excuse me, and by them the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God was exchanged for and represented by images resembling mortal man and birds and beasts and reptiles. You see, the world today claims to be wise, yet they become as fools. You know, it's interesting, speaking of wisdom, anybody here, how many people here are Ford people? Raise your hand if you really love Fords, if you don't mind. How about Chevys? Who's the Chevy people? Yeah, yeah. Wow, the Ford people were a little hesitant, raising their hands, but the Chevy dudes were all, Chevy, yeah! I remember being in auto shop back in high school. Ford, fixed and repaired daily. There was one for Chevy, too, but something wrong with the side of the road, I don't remember, but it always kind of cracked me up, you know, but... Automaker Henry Ford had asked the guy named Charlie Steinmetz to build generators for his factory back in the day when he was pretty much getting going. Well, one, of the, day, one day, one of the generators came to a halt and kind of held up everything that was going on there, and the, his own repairmen could not find you know, the problem. So they called this, the guy who made the generator for them, they called Steinmetz, and he came. He flew out, he tinkered with the machine, and then he threw the, the, the switch, and then... The generators, they whirled to life. It came on again. And, and so, you know, a few weeks later, Ford got a bill in the mail for $10,000. Remember, this is back in like the 20s or 30s. And flabbergasted, and the rather tight-fisted car maker inquired to the gentleman, is, why is your bill so high? And this is what he said. He said, for tinkering with the generators, $10. For knowing where to tinker, $9,990. Wisdom of the world. Wisdom. But notice again the wisdom of the world. Just glance with me back here in our text in James 3. Glance back at verse 14. 
This is the wisdom of the world. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. You see, beloved in Christ, true wisdom is only found in God himself. Can I have an amen? amen? True wisdom that is lasting wisdom is of God and found within God himself. You know, and as we receive his Holy Spirit, as we repent of our sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're born again of the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit comes, we're told, in what? Tabernacles within us. He comes and lives within us. He makes us a new creation, the Bible says. But you know what's awesome? You know, and most of us might not realize this, but when he comes, guess one of the, one of the attributes that he brings? Wisdom. He brings wisdom that is available to each one of us. You know, it's interesting. Back in Exodus chapter 28, we read this. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with them from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in the priest's office, even Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar and Aaron's sons. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the Spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, and that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So even here we see the Lord was referring to those who could make these fine clothes, these fine instruments, that, that God had filled them with his Spirit of wisdom. There is also the gift of the Holy Spirit, or excuse me, the gift of wisdom, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, the high school group, we've been talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit on Friday nights. It says, For to one is given the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. There is a word of wisdom that the Lord can give to each one as well. But notice again back in our text, the wisdom from above. So we see the description, we saw the description, we studied the description last week, we just kind of looked over briefly right now what the earthly wisdom is, but the wisdom from above is, first of all, it is pure. Wisdom. Wisdom from above. Now, you know, I love the word here in wisdom, the, the word wisdom here in Greek is Sophia. You ever met somebody named Sophia? Their name is literally in the Greek, wisdom. Love that. I love that name. And, and it's interesting because even in the Greek, when, it, when, when you look at this word, it's actually in the feminine context. And, and, and I love that because when you go back and you read the book of Proverbs, wisdom is referred to in the feminine sense over and over and over again. It's beautiful how wherever we go within the Word of God, when we go into the original languages, when we go down into the text, we all see how richly and beautifully it ties together. Sophia, the wisdom of God. It literally means wisdom broad and full of intelligence. Let me read what one Greek scholar said this word wisdom means here in the Greek. It says, to the Greeks, this word Sophia spoke of a quality or attitude rather than an action. Its basic meaning, according to Aristotle, is knowledge of the most precious things. It referred to deep knowledge and learning, implying cultivation of mind and enlightened understanding. In other words, Sophia, or wisdom, speaks of the knowledge of the things that really matter the things that matter most. That is the truths of God. Truths such as life and death, God and man, righteousness and sin, heaven and hell, and so on. Does the world have knowledge of, sub of such subjects? No, but the believer does. Amen? Amen. And that's what this word wisdom here is, is, is pointing to. And you know, it's interesting, flip back with me to Ephesians chapter 1, because Paul says something profound about this very subject as well. Where it comes from, who it is, what is about wisdom. Ephesians chapter 1.
Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Here it is in verse 8, check it out. Which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, making known to us the mystery of his will. Do you notice how he, he links wisdom with, with, with revealing unto us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all, unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Jesus Christ, we find all wisdom, all Sophia, everything that we need. Now, God's wisdom wisdom that comes through Jesus Christ, wisdom that we find through the word of God, is so much different than that of the world. You know, as we read in the book of Proverbs over and over, I don't know how long it's been since you've read the book of Proverbs, but, you know, I really recommend you try to read that once a year, just to go through and just receive the, the wisdom. You know, again, as we're trying to read, hopefully everybody here trying to read through the Bible once a year, maybe once every two years, and continually going through the Word of God. But when you read the book of Proverbs, you know, it's, it's so awesome because we, we see what the result can be of following the wisdom from above. The wisdom that comes from the Lord. But he also gives warning of what, what happens when we follow the wisdom from below. You know what? It's, it's really interesting because you always see that, my son, if you follow the words that I give you, if you follow the wisdom of the fear of the Lord, if you follow that wisdom of these words, you will not go into sin. You won't be led into sin. But if you follow the ways of the world, guess what? You're going to be led into sin. You having problems in your life with a sin problem? You know, there's a habitual sin that you just can't get victory over. First of all, know that you're being lied to by the enemy. There is no sin that we cannot have victory over in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But so many of us, oh, I'm an alcoholic. I'll always be an alcoholic. Or, you know, I have problems with my language. I'll always have problems with my language. You know, I, you know, I can't get over this porn thing. Or, you know, whatever it is, anger issues. Oh, it's okay. God understands. No, he wants to clean us out. And one of the great ways we can do that is following the words of wisdom we find in the Word of God. Walking down the correct paths. You know, if I have a problem with eating donuts, it's not a wise thing to keep driving by the donut shop. Right? Especially if I go around 10 or 20 times until there's a parking place and available in the front. And that's what I love about the wisdom from above. It keeps us from the wickedness of the world. How do we live in these last days? Be a man, be a woman of the word of God. Coming to church is not enough, beloved in Christ. Coming to church is wonderful. It is something we are to do as Christians. As we, we referenced earlier that as we come together, as we read in Hebrews, is to, to, to love to love each other, to stir each other up, to love and to good works, to praise Jesus together, to be the body of Christ. It's not okay not to go to church, by the way. That's not okay. But you know, we need to understand that as we come together, it is to focus upon Jesus Christ, to focus upon his word, and to help us to stay away from the wickedness that's in the world. But, you know, when we look at this plainly, when we look at the difference between the wisdom of God, wisdom from above, and the wisdom of the world, it's not really that difficult to understand, is it, when, when the world looks at us and thinks we're crazy? That our wisdom is stupidity. But, you know, what we need to do is to start to look at the wisdom of the world as stupidity as foolishness. Now, again, I don't mean this in a denigrating manner. Let's look at everybody else and, oh, you poor fools, you idiots, you morons. I don't mean that at all. Because that's how they'll look at us. That's of the world. That, that's wisdom. No, we look at them and we feel sorry for them. Oh, they really believe in evolution. Wow, that's, 
That's really sad. Wow, they really believe that, that the laws don't matter within our country or our culture. Wow, they don't really, they really believe that it's okay to murder a baby in the womb. They really believe these things. And yet we should look at them and never be intimidated. Oh, well, they're more educated than I am. Oh, really? Are you educated in the word of God? Then you are more wise than the greatest of all within the world can present. Don't be surprised when the Lord looks at us and thinks we're crazy. Because you know what, beloved in Christ, our, business, our wisdom is to be based upon that which is from above. Our wisdom is to be based upon the word of God. Their wisdom is base. Their wisdom is focused on self-centeredness and selfishness and themselves. That's what their wisdom is. That's the wisdom of the world. And you know what, what's interesting? The wisdom from above and the wisdom that is earthly can never meet. Can I say it? Have an amen. You know, it's that whole thing, you know, I want to be in the world, you know, and I still want to be in the world and be, be as much in the world as I can be and, and, not, and still be a Christian. That, that can't be as Christians. We need to be those who are sold out for Jesus Christ. We need to be those who, you know what, I want to be so into Jesus that I'm, that I'm here in the world and he's using me for his glory. But, but these things don't, don't tie us down. Because these two can never meet, and the only place they can meet the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of, of that is from above is at the cross of Jesus Christ. As our sin was placed upon Jesus Christ so that we might find forgiveness, so that we might find eternal life. That is the only place that, that we can meet. Now notice again that the wisdom from above is its first pure. Notice, you know, a lot of your commentators, we see seven things by the way that wisdom is that is from above, seven listed things. And the first thing is that it, it is first pure. And as you read the commentators, they all kind of point out, you know, that the rest of it is kind of just almost ways to describe pureness. Peaceable, mercy, good fruits, impartial. And, and that the, the, the wisdom that comes from above is first pure. Purity. You know, literally here, undefiled. How many of our lives are pure? Oh, don't raise your hands, but how many of our lives are undefiled? You know, it's funny, there's a lot of false things going around the church these days and one of them is that we don't need to worry about being holy as Christ is holy we don't need to worry about pureness it doesn't matter we don't need to worry about this in our life but you know what's interesting was Jesus Christ pure anyone yes he was completely pure amen so when we come to Christ who is now living within us Jesus Christ and so as the Father, as we're told, is conforming us into the, gym, into the image of Jesus Christ, how are we going to be coming? More pure. Amen? More pure in our lives. We're going to be walking more like Jesus. We're going to be denying ourselves. We're going to be crucifying the flesh. And, and purity should be something that's important in our lives. You know, there's a, a thing... Uh, you know, my mom's out visiting. It's great to have my mom here. If you haven't met her, Lois, you know, the, the Brooklynite originally, we, we got her going down to Southern California for many years, but love my mom. Great to have her here. But she's like, we sat down to watch a movie the other day, and she was so excited. Like, she's like, what is this thing? Why is this playing? Why don't we hear these little words here and there? Little curse words and things that you might even hear on TV. Oh, it's called clear play. And it's a thing you can go online, you can buy it for your family, you can put, you know, there's I think a monthly fee that you, we pay, and basically it, it clears out all the junk from the movies that we want to watch. You know, even something as simple as The Sandlot. You know, a, a kid's movie that has a, quite a few little curse words in it. It's a blessing to be able to sit there and watch it as a family, and it gets filtered out. You can do this with Blu-rays, you can do it with R-rated movies, you can do it with PG movies. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. And you know what the goal is to have that in our home? Is to have more purity in our house. We need to think about that, beloved, in Christ. We need to think about the television shows we watch. We need to think about the books that we read. We need to think about the movies that we go and see. We need to think about the music that we listen to. Is it pure? 
Is it edifying? Is it building us up? But even, is it pure? Is our lives, what about our thought lives? Are they pure? What about where we go on the internet? What do they say that even some 60 to 70 to percent of guys in the church are addicted to pornography? Hey, repent. If you're having a problem with it, then come and find new life in the blood of Jesus Christ. Find forgiveness. And by the way, it's flowing over into women as well, in the church even. Seek purity in your lives and know that by the word of God, the wisdom of God says we can have victory over these things. And if you have to put blocking software on your computer, then do it. Blocking software on your phone, then do it. Tell others to be accountable. Well, I'm embarrassed to do it. Who cares if you're embarrassed? Be embarrassed, but get help and seek purity in our lives. You know why? Because this world, you know what? They want us to be more and more and more impure. More and more defiled. That's why we're standing out, by the way, more and more within our culture. Because we're seeking to be pure. Do you even see within the church today that there are those who will make fun of those who actually believe the Bible is the word of God? Who stand up against homosexual marriage? They, they make fun of them. They think that they're wackos. Do you know that we're on the, the terror watch list? I think the first one are evangelical Christians. And then I think it's you know, a couple of terror, like regular you know, Al-Qaeda and this, and then it's the Catholic Church. They're up there too. It's craziness. It's craziness because they don't understand purity. May we understand and seek it in our lives. Notice the second thing. First thing is wisdom from above is pure. Secondly, it's peaceable. Notice what it says there. In, in literally, it says peace-loving. It's peaceable. It's peace-loving. And again, this isn't the peace that's a peace at any cost and, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, no, this is a peace that comes from above. This is a peace that comes from God's wisdom. Thirdly, we see that it's gentle. Other translations say it's considerate or kind, gentle at all times, courteous. This is the wisdom from above. It's gentle. It's, you know, when we, have, when we talk in with people and we're exchanging ideas, are we gentle? Are we peaceable? Are, are we presenting pure ideas with them? Are we courteous, gentle? Boy, what a great thing for us within our families today, amen? So funny, we can go to work and be courteous and gentle and kind, and yet come home and be uncourteous, discourteous, almost mean at times. Hey, let's be gentle with one another. Let's walk in the wisdom of Christ. Notice the fourth thing, it says, open to reason. The wisdom that is from God is open from reason, open to reason, literally they're willing to yield, submissive, easy to be entreated, willing to yield to others. Amplified says it is willing to yield to reason. Boy, it's funny, if you, you compare this to a lot of people out there that are presenting a lot of bad ideas, in the, in especially in politics, especially within the entertainment industry, it's like the opposite of these things, isn't it? They're not open to reason. It's one of the things that cracks me up the most nowadays when I like to talk with people or debate people. They're not open to debate. They just start calling you names. Have you had that happen to you yet? You're closed-minded. You're, ha you're a hater. You're homophobic. You're, you know, Islamophobic. You're this or that. And it's funny, I had one of my old professors when I was, you know, in the school of ministry, and he said he believes all that kind of speech is actually hate speech. Because it takes it, and all of a sudden it tells you that you actually have some sort of mental disorder. Interesting. You see, beloved in Christ, we need to be those who are open to reason. In other words, reasoning from the scriptures, bringing up, contending earnestly for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. Be those who are open to reason, listening to people. Yes, I understand what you believe about Muhammad. I understand what you believe about Islam. I understand what you believe about Mormonism. I understand what you believe about creation or about evolution. But can we look at the facts? Can we look at what God's word says? Now this is also, this wisdom from above, notice there, is full of mercy or full of compassion. You see, the wisdom from above leads us to all these places. And notice this, the next there, number five, it says good fruits or good deeds in the New Living Translation. 
full of compassion and full of good fruits. Notice there, number six, it's impartial. In other words, it's without partiality, it's unwavering, it shows no favoritism, it is wholehearted and straightforward. You know, I'll be real honest with you, I don't mind being impartial about my faith in Jesus Christ. Unwavering, showing no favoritism, walking after Jesus as wholeheartedly as I can. Can I have an amen? amen. Can I have an amen? Amen. 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 We need to be those who aren't afraid to walk wholeheartedly after Christ. And, and again, it's impartial. Notice it's without partiality because it's not about what I believe. It's not about what I say. It's not about what I think. It's about what God thinks. It's about what God says. It's about what God tells us how we are to live our lives. When people say, well, don't judge me, man. It's like, you're right. I don't judge. God judges. He judges the living and the dead. It is his word that we bring forth to people. This is what God says in his word. And you know what? It shows no favoritism. By the way, I, I know it's real easy to pick out certain sins and pick on them, isn't it? Look at that drunkard over there. What a buzzard, man. Or look at that homeless guy, dude. Get a job, you bum. <sighs> and then we go home, right? And we you know, yell at our wives or our husbands or we you know, have these other sins. We gossip or we do other things. Hey, God, God's wisdom is impartial. He doesn't look at one sin and say, oh, you know, that's really disgusting. And oh, oh, that's not too bad. Bill, your sins are okay, but oh, everybody else's sins are real bad. You ever notice that? Even my own sins when somebody else is doing them. They're, not, they're, they're worse when somebody else does them. Amen? God's word is impartial, man. There's no favoritism. And lastly, look at what it is. It is sincere. It is without hypocrisy. It is always sincere, free from doubts, free from wavering, free from insincerity, we're told in the Amplified Version. When we give the wisdom of God, I think there can come a lot of doubt, especially within our culture today, because again, we're looked at as stupid. Go to a university and bring up the Bible. You'll be laughed at if not kicked out of the college or get an F on your, your, your grade. But you know what? We need to be those who are, you know, ah, this is where I make my stand. This is where I get my beliefs from. It's not from Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel when he's alive. It's not from, you know, this or that. It's from the Word of God because this doesn't change. It's unyielding. It's unchanging. And notice it's, it's, it's without hypocrisy. And so we need to be those who are unwavering and in, in sincere in the wisdom that we even give to others. What wisdom do we give to people, by the way? Is it wisdom that is like this? Is it wisdom that is pure? Is it wisdom that is peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits? Is it impartial and sincere? In other words, are we giving them the word of God? That's where true wisdom from above comes from, is from the word of God. And again, I love reading through this list because for some reason, it just makes me feel good. Amen? It's like meditating on the attributes of God. You know, I love waking up in the morning. It's like, sometimes it's hard to wake up and you're like, oh, it's early, but whoa, Lord, your mercies, they're new today. This is awesome. I got a new gift to open. I remember being kids when we were little kids, me and my brother Bob, man, we'd always sneak down in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve to check out the, the stash, amen? We had to go down, check it out, you know, see what was down there. My mom's getting mad at me. <laughs> but we used to love that, and we, I used to love, you know, who could sleep Christmas Eve when you were a kid, by the way, dude? Are you kidding me? There was stuff under the tree to be opened. It's like when we're talking on Wednesday nights with, or Friday nights with the teens and we're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, who, who would leave any gifts under the tree unopened with your name on it? Anybody? No way. Who's, who's that for? Oh, somebody. Oh, who's that for? Who's that for? Keep, oh, you know, and, and that little kid can still even come out in us today. We don't leave anything under the tree and we need to understand that as we look at these, you know, things that, that is from the wisdom of above, it reminds us of God and who he is and how he wants to work in and through us for his good pleasure. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control against such there is no law. Amen? Doesn't it sound really familiar to the list we're just finishing up? It's crazy. I love this. Now, what's the result? Look at verse 18 in our text. What's the result of this wisdom that is from above? Notice verse 18. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, there's a lot of songs. Anybody here, who was alive during the 60s, if you don't mind raising your hands? I'm not trying to embarrass you. Right on. How many of you were like flower children, you know, or, you know, things like that? There was a few of you, a couple of you. Awesome, dude. Gee, I didn't know that. Oh, peace, man, peace. <laughs> there was a lot of talk of peace back in the 60s and early 70s. Peace, all the, you know, again, they wanted peace. There was the peace sign, and there's all these different things. But you know what? How many people, by the way, want more peace in their lives, even today, even this morning? Raise your hands if you want more peace. Amen. Dude, peace. And we're not talking about peace, by the way. This peace even here isn't talking about the absence of conflict. Well, that's how we think about peace a lot of times, isn't it? Dude, just give me a, just be quiet. You know, with all the kids, quiet. I just want there to be peace. Or the kids all go off somewhere, and all of a sudden you look at your wife and you're like, you hear that? There's nothing there. Oh. If you're a parent, you know exactly, you know, especially a younger parent, you know, like at the kids, you know, especially for those of the, the ones who have newborns that are here in the fellowship, it's like, do you hear that? No, I don't. Me neither. Isn't it awesome, man? Let's go to sleep quick before she wakes up or he wakes up. But that's how we can think of peace a lot of times. Oh, peace to me. What would peace be? Peace would be going to the doctor. I get a clean bill of health. Peace is going, I, you know, $5 million in the bank. Amen? Well, maybe 10 for the rest of my life, right? Five might not about cover it. But 10 million for the rest of my life. Peace would be having a house. Peace would be having all this stuff. Peace would be having a job that I love or, you know, being able to, you know, peace is, I'm not sure all my kids are, that's not, none of those things are peace. But Again, the wisdom of the world says they are. Find your security in your IRA. Now, wisdom says, you know, it's not bad to have an IRA, but don't find your security there. We find our security in Christ. And the peace, notice that it's talking about, is not peace in the absence of a storm, it's peace in the midst of the storm. Peace that we can have in the midst of the storms in our life. By the way, how many people here in the midst of a storm in your life? Raise your hand, please, again. I, I know I asked you to, this is how I keep you awake, by the way. Have you raising your hands. You exercise, you go home. It's like, good, this feels good, right? So how many people are going through a storm right now? Anybody? There are quite a few people. You know what? Those of you who aren't, guess what? There's a storm coming. Oh, Pastor, you're supposed to make me feel good. I know. It's just the truth, man. The truth is we've either, we're either in a storm, and by the way, we're going to get through that storm one way or the other, whether it's going home to Jesus or whether he brings us through here on this earth. But we're either in a storm, we're either out of a storm, or we're going into another storm. That's our lives. This life was not meant to be perfect. When we go to eternity, that's going to be perfect. So, but the radical thing here is we can have a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And again, this isn't peace at any cost. Paul said, man, I, I make it my goal to live peaceably with as much as it is within my reach with all men, with all women, to live peaceably. But what I love about this is that we can have peace even in the midst of our storms. But we have to have the wisdom to come to Jesus Christ. If we're living in the wisdom of the world, don't be surprised if you're in a storm and you have your, 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 your nights are dark. You can't sleep. You're worried all the time. There's no peace in your life. That's because you're living according to the wisdom of this world. And by the way, we need to understand that this is our default setting in the flesh. That's our default setting. And we need to understand, yes, those of us who have repented of our sins, been born again of the Holy Spirit of God, believed on Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, those of us who are followers of Christ, we still have the flesh. Amen? I like how Paul describes it, dude. There's a battle. Amen? Every day there's a battle. That's one of the things I cannot wait until I die. Might sound weird. 
I can't wait. One of the things I can't wait to get to heaven is not to have a desire to sin against my Jesus anymore. No more desire to sin. But we also have the Spirit. And as we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Now, as we're closing, I want to just read a few scriptures to you talking about having more peace. In other words, as we have more wisdom in our lives, guess what? We're going to have more peace in our lives. You know, why don't we go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 7. We're just going to read a few scriptures in the Proverbs just before we close. Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 1. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. Go back to Proverbs chapter 4. Just a couple chapters to the left. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight and keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, and, for, and from it will flow springs of life. Go back to chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 2, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. Proverbs 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures. Isn't that awesome? That's how we're to seek out the word of God, the wisdom of God, like silver, like hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of the justice, watching over the ways of the saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, and every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech. May we be those who come to the Lord Jesus, those who come to seek wisdom. You know, back in the 70s there was a christian band called malcolm and alwyn and some of you might remember if you don't you know look them up on i think they're on itunes and some of the other things malcolm and alwyn but they wrote a song and and one of the songs that i like the most it says i got myself some wisdom from a leather bible book i got myself a savior when i took a second look you see as we come to god's word We don't just come and get some wisdom from a leather Bible book. We come to find a Savior when we take that second look. True wisdom is knowing Jesus. True wisdom is walking with Jesus in love, in obedience. That's wisdom, beloved, in Christ. That's wisdom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we come and... We study what wisdom is from the earth and what wisdom is from above. Lord, there are some changes that we ask that you would help us to make in our lives, Lord, to walk more wisely, to be men and women of your word, men and wisdom who walk, or men and women who walk in your wisdom, Lord God. Father, I pray for each heart here, Lord Jesus, each soul, Father, that that your spirit would touch Lord, 
I pray for those who are here this morning who have never repented of their sins, who have never believed upon you to be the Lord and the Savior of their lives, Lord, and never come to new life in you, Father, that you would soften their hearts this morning and that they would hear that today is the day of their salvation, that they would repent and come unto you. Lord, I pray for the downcast here, Lord, the hurting. Father, that you would touch them and draw them through your word of wisdom, Lord, that they would find out who they are, that they're the apple of your eye, Lord, that they would find grace, that they would find forgiveness, that they would find new life and power in you, Lord. Father, open all of our eyes and hearts, incline our ears to your wisdom, Lord. Father, lastly, we, we, we lift up all those the last couple of weeks, Lord, Lord, who have been oh, just touched by the face of evil through terror, Lord. And lastly, here in Mali, Lord Jesus, that you would bless and comfort those who have lost loved ones, Lord, those who have been wounded, Lord. And that even above that, Lord, you would be glorified, that many tens of hundreds and thousands would come to know you in the midst of this, Lord. Use us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.